Called by P.C. Wren. Lesthwaite was not really popular at St. Bury, though he had his friends, of course, or, if not friends, acquaintances, followers. Young men, new to Siam, were quite apt to follow him for a time, as he was always very nice to them, always ready to listen to their troubles, to give good advice, accept their drinks, win their money, and sell them ponies. In fact, to one of them, he had sold the same animal twice, first as a very shaggy Shan pony, not only hairy at the heel, but hairy all over, and a month later, when it had been stolen, he sold it to him again, beautifully clipped, swept and garnished, and looking twice the horse it used to be. That was why it cost twice as much the second time. And among the older men, he had such companions as any good fellow has, any man who plays polo well, shoots well, eats, drinks, and talks well, plays billiards and poker more than well, and is ready to bet with anyone at any time on anything. He was a man very well known throughout the length and breadth of Siam, and yet not exactly popular. Everyone agreed that Mrs. Lesthwaite was too good for her husband. John Lesthwaite quite agreed, but expressed it slightly differently. She was too good altogether. If she hadn't been quite so good, she would have been a great deal better. As a wife, that is to say, for although she never dreamed of reproaching him, she was a living reproach to him, and no dream about it. When he returned from the club a couple of hours late for dinner, and in a condition that he would describe as slightly sozzled, there were no recriminations. That was the annoying part of it. Had she pointed out to him that after waiting in a condition of annoyance and irritation for a couple of hours, hunger had turned into sick faintness, that the dinner was spoilt, that it was hopeless to try to keep Ching Lai up to the mark if he never knew when he would be called upon to serve a dinner that he had cooked, that she loathed dining within an hour of bedtime, he would have had excuse and reason for voluble and angry reply. He would have told her that women who nagged ought to be muzzled, that a scold needs a scold's bridle, that a wife with a grievance ought to be put out of her misery. He would have shouted her down, shown her who was master, told her he would be as late as he liked and a jolly sight later. He would have had a grievance of his own, and he would have aired it too. Hot air, and plenty of it. But what can you do with a woman who never says a word? who gives you nothing to go on and simply won't be the other party to a row. No, it takes two to make a quarrel, and when one knows that one is in the wrong, it is rather deflating to have no more useful knowledge than that to stiffen one's backbone and feed one's wrath. Nor if, in a slightly alcoholic gush of sudden bonhomie and affection, he packed the car full of others like unto himself and rolled up at the bungalow with half a dozen extra for dinner, did she utter one word of complaint that a simple little dinner for two should be turned into a dinner party for eight at a minute's notice? Not a word. It seemed that nothing could ever provoke the placid woman to wrath. Not the use of a new clean curtain end, or a silk cushion for the wiping of dusty boots, or an oily gun barrel. Not the scarring and searing with smouldering cigarette ends of the polished surface of a cherished piece of furniture brought out from home. Not the throwing of stinking cigar butts into the pretty flower bowls, not the opening and reading of her letters whenever they fell into his hands, though this was a thing she hated almost beyond bearing. It was not that he wasn't perfectly welcome to read every letter she received, not that she had any epistolary secret whatsoever, but she did like to feel that her home mail was hers, that a letter addressed to her was something private and personal, and that she might at least be allowed to open them herself. Certainly it was very childish and foolish of her, as she freely admitted, to feel annoyed, hurt, disappointed, in some way cheated, when she found her packet of letters from home all ripped open and lying scattered just where he had dropped them beside his chair. Of course, there are silly people to whom the act of opening a Christmas or birthday parcel gives almost as much pleasure as do the contents themselves, and Amari Lestwaite must have been one of those idiots, for an opened and crumpled envelope and a letter of which the sheets were in the wrong order 
was something not exactly spoilt, but definitely damaged. She had once tried to make her husband understand this queer idiosyncrasy, and the effort had been neither well received nor ever repeated. Uh huh, said Lestwaite. Secrets, eh? Afraid I might stumble on something. Well, well, well. So that's it, is it? Still waters, eh? What? Like to open the envelopes yourself? Don't talk such damn nonsense. You don't want me to read your letters, and there's some good reason for it. So thereafter, no reproach, no complaint. A very foolish woman, one perceives, unless one takes the view that she was a very wise one, realising that the greatest of all human blessings is peace, and the worthiest of all human efforts, the striving for peace. Lest the unfortunate Mari be thought an even sillier woman than she really was, it should be stated that she accepted none of her husband's unkindnesses, his thoughtlessness, his inconsiderate habits, his more objectionable acts and ways, without protest. Once and for all, she told him that she disliked or hated or detested this, that or the other, but only once, so that when he annoyed, disappointed, irritated, angered, frustrated or hurt her, he knew quite well that he was doing so. He knew, for example, that she loathed being called Maria with the accent on the second syllable, and by no other name than Maria did he ever address her. It is probably impossible for people more fortunately situated to estimate the difficulty with which such a man as John Lesthwaite bore the yoke of matrimony with so tiresome a woman. A man righteously angered might as well stand and address an impassioned harangue to his horse as to a woman who accepted it in meek silence, or at any rate in silence. For this unfortunate fellow had a strong and abiding suspicion that his wife was not really meek. Not a bit of it. She was certainly no fool. Undeniably, she was a woman of spirit. She could deal with a recalcitrant servant as well and firmly as he himself could do, and in the give and take of social intercourse at the club, she could hold her own. In his own idiom, she took nothing from anybody. From anybody but himself, that is to say. But from him, she took anything, stood anything, bore anything, and everything. And it was most damnably annoying. How a good row would have cleared the air. How easily he could have shouted her down, put her in the wrong, routed and defeated her completely. But you cannot defeat an enemy who won't fight. And you cannot make an enemy of a person who won't be inimical. How successfully he could have defended himself every time. But you can't defend yourself unless you are attacked. And attack him, she would not. She wouldn't even remonstrate when he did something to which any other woman would have objected when he repeated what he knew to be an offence, when he did something which, reasonably or unreasonably from his point of view, she had asked him not to do. Thinking it over, as he sat on the veranda, drinking stengar after stengar, smoking cigar after cigar, he wondered how on earth he had ever come to fall in love with Mari Bardsley, a bread-and-butter vicarage miss, if ever there was one. Perhaps that had been the secret of it, though. Contrast. She had caught him on the rebound, after his affair with the Black Spider. Gad, if poor little Weber had only died a month earlier, and he himself had married the Spider, she would have made the fur fly all right when he came home drunk from the club, came home two or three hours late for dinner, came to bed drunk, and woke her up at four in the morning. Rouse! He would have had all the rouse he wanted. She would have been delivered of a mouthful, and himself endowed with an earful whenever he annoyed her. Not only that, she would have given him something to talk about, too. By the time she had ticked him off for his peccadilloes and he had returned the compliment with regard to hers, he would have had no cause for complaint on the score of a humdrum life and dullness in the home. Funny, it had been precisely the other way about with the Webbers. Webber had been all for peace, and she all for the breaking of it. He against her had been peace at any price versus war at any price. Poor little beggar. A dangerous woman, really. Poisonous. 
No wonder they called her the Black Spider, and when he died, said that she had eaten him. Still, John Hector Montague Lesthwaite was rather a different proposition from little Jimmy Webber. Yes, if the Black Spider and John Hector Montague Lesthwaite had made a match of it, she'd have met her match. But he had gone on leave, and although far from bored with the affair with the Black Spider, had met Mari, and just gone all sloppy and sentimental. Something good and noble in him must have been touched by her simplicity. Simplicity, ignorance, sweetness, purity. Hell, another little drink wouldn't do us any harm. If such a thing were possible, Mari Lesthwaite grew even quieter, more placid, more undisturbably peaceful, as her health failed. At first, the symptoms of her illness were only an increasing lassitude, listlessness, and general physical weakness, as her body inevitably attuned itself to the condition of her mind. Attacks of dengue fever, increasing in frequency and severity, did nothing to improve matters, nor did her husband's attitude of, come along, born tired, for God's sake, pull yourself together, get on anybody's nerves, like a death's head at dinner last night, spoilt the party completely. If you can't improve on last night's effort as a hostess, you'd better not show up at all when people come to dinner. Don't know what's come over you. Can't think what's the matter with you nowadays. I don't know what's wrong with you, and I doubt if you do either. But there for once, John Lesthwaite was wrong. She knew quite well what was wrong. Life itself, that was all. Infinite weariness, boredom, disappointment, frustration. Had she been conversant with the jargon, she might have referred to the damming up of the libido, the sapping of the élan vital. As it was, she merely wondered if it were possible literally to be bored to death, to be genuinely tired of life and by life. Then came insomnia and the nightly pacing of the big bare bedroom while her hearty husband snored undisturbed. It was the lady doctor, head of the American medical mission, who first raised the question of Mrs. Lesthwaite's health. Bluntly, she told John Lesthwaite that it was high time he called in a doctor to have a look at his wife, and that whether it were she herself or another whom he called in was neither here nor there. In fact, what she would suggest was that he'd take his wife down to Bangkok and get the best possible opinion. And what about his suggesting that she should mind her own business? Well, wasn't it a doctor's business to do precisely what she was doing? Isn't anyone's business to help a friend in need? Oh, and you think your friend, my wife, is in need of your help, do you? Sneered John Lesthwaite. As a doctor, yes, very definitely. Well, I'm sure I hope you'll come and see her and do your very best for her when I call you in. But Dr. Amelia Dupuy called in without being called in and gave Mrs. Lesthwaite, whom she liked, admired and pitied, a piece of her robust mind, talked to her for her good and gave her sound advice, medical and other. Also some little white tablets with strict injunctions never to take more than one at a time, never more than one in 24 hours and never more than three in a week. They'll make you sleep, my dear. Guarantee you three good nights a week anyhow. And that'll help you along tremendously. And now then, one more thing before I scram. I'm going to London in February on my way back to America. Come with me. Oh, but my husband. Not talking about him, Mari. We're talking about you. Think it over. Mari Lestwaite thought it over. It did her utmost to brace herself against the crushing disappointment that she knew would follow her suggesting the matter to her husband. Broached the subject and listened in a resigned silence to all he had to say about damned meddlesome interfering busybodies who have the infernal cheek to butt in where they're not wanted and try to arrange other people's lives for them. And steadily, Mari Lesthwaite's health grew worse. And soon after Dr. Amelia Depew's departure, she was obviously very ill. 
And what could have been more annoying than this illness to so hospitably minded and socially inclined a person as John Nestwaite, saddled with a wife who, far from being a social asset and helper at her best, was now an obstacle, a hindrance, and a nuisance. It was altogether too bad, intolerable. The climate of Sinburi was no worse for her than for him. No worse than for other women who were merry and bright, played their game of bridge, enjoyed their cocktails and cigarettes, rode and danced and picnicked. If other women could play golf, tennis, some of them squash even, surely she could, at any rate, get about the house and do her duty as a wife and hostess? One night, he returned from the club in an evil temper after a long and somewhat disastrous session at stud poker. An infernal dark horse of a fellow, a bird of passage visiting the American consul, had taught John Lesthwaite that he was not the best poker player in Siam. A very expensive lesson. Also, his liver was out of order. Must have eaten something. Couldn't be what he had drunk, of course, because he could put away short drinks till the cows came home. Hadn't he been doing it for years? And had anyone ever seen him the worse for liquor? Entering the bedroom, switching on the bedside lamp, yawning loudly, he disturbed his wife, who, with a quiet, Hello? That you, John? Turned over. As he sat on the side of his bed, winding up his watch, as was his wont, he noticed beneath the bedside lamp a little cardboard box which he'd not seen before. What was this? Some other damned doctor interfering behind his back? Picking up the box, he saw a number of white tablets. Almost guiltily, he started as his wife's bed creaked. She turned again and sat up. What's this muck? he growled. Give me one, John, will you? I hadn't meant to take any again this week, but I know I shan't sleep tonight, and I've, I've such a crashing headache. I've been nearly blind with it all day. One in a, in a glass of lime juice. And lying back on her pillow, she pressed her hands to her face, covering her eyes. Removing the tumbler from the carafe, John Lesthwaite poured out a glass of the lime juice, which always stood, at night, on the table between their beds. Into this, he shook a tablet from the box. Another fell. Perhaps his hand trembled. For a third, and a fourth, and a fifth followed. Removing the little net from the sugar basin on the tray, he put in a teaspoonful of sugar and patiently stirred the contents of the glass. There you are, born tired, he said. Marie Lesthwaite took her hands from her face, raised herself into a sitting position and took the glass. Thank you, John, she said, and drank. Bitter, she added, speaking her own life's sufficient epitaph as she lay back upon the pillow. Old Dr Jackson who had really retired years before, was sympathetically kind and helpful. Poor lady. Poor, poor dear. And poor John Lesthwaite. What a tragedy. Her heart must have been very, very tired. Everybody else was also most kind and sympathetic. It was generally agreed that John Lesthwaite bore himself very well, kept a stiff upper lip, and refrained from any obvious indulgence in self-pity and unmanly grief. Well, well, happy days again. Bachelor Hall, no restraints and the sky the limit. Wonderful parties, great doings. Not a shadow of regret, not a twinge of remorse. The poor creature had not been happy, got no fun from life, was altogether too blooming good for this world and well out of it. And doubtless old Jackson was right. Damn it, he was a doctor and ought to know. Weak heart, tired, malaria and dengue fever do affect one's heart. Yes, died of heart trouble. Probably those tablets were just doctor's eye wash. She took one and thought it would send you to sleep. <laughs> and it did. Just as well that nobody knew anything about them, perhaps. There was one thing they never would know, for he had chucked them into the river and burnt the box. Who had given them to her? Why, that interfering, frumpish old freak, Amelia de Pew. Just as well that she'd left Siam. Well, well, all's well that ends well. 
a month ago today. Nay. The houseboy, I soon appeared on the veranda, where John Lesthwaite was enjoying his post-prandial cigar, alone for once. Well? The nine men called. What the devil are you talking about, you... The houseboy stared foolishly, as well he might. What was biting the lunatic, damned idiot? John Lesthwaite rose to his feet. The mistress called faltered the man. You thought you had your mistress call? And she's been dead a month? I thought so, master. Thought? I'll give you something to think about. The Siamese butler, cringing before his angry master, backed away, turned and hurried from the veranda. John Lesthwaite sat down again, more annoyed and angry than the incident seemed to warrant. Thought he heard his mistress call. A fool. Lazy scoundrel had been lying asleep. Something had awakened him suddenly, and as they all do, he thought it must have been a call from the front of the house. And yet the half-wit had never done it before. Never done it with regard to the master, anyway. Perhaps that was only because there was no mistake about it when John Lesway called. <laughs> yes, probably she used to call in that silly, feeble voice of hers, and the servants could never be sure whether she'd called or the canary had coughed. Well, not to say canary, for one didn't keep him in Siam. But perhaps the kitten had mewed. Nay. Well? The number two boy stepped out from the drawing room onto the veranda. The nigh called. No, roared Lesthwaite. The nigh didn't call. He rose to his feet, amazed to find that he was actually trembling. It must be with rage, of course. And what's more, he growled, you know that I didn't call. What's this, some game? Do you mean to tell me you thought that I... No, nay, interrupted the man. I thought the nine men called. What? You thought... Lesthwaite strode toward the servant. The man stood his ground. I heard the nine men call, he added. But you besotted idiot, you damned half-wit, you cursed, croaking mudfish. You know perfectly well that the nine men is... The mistress is dead repeated the boy stolidly. Nevertheless, she called. But you blithering son of a sow! How on earth could... Yes, repeated the man for the third time. It, it is indeed, as the Nye says, but a Nye Mem called. But there is no Nye Mem in the house, as you know perfectly well. It is as the Nye pleases. It is as he says. There is no nine men in the house. Well, then. Nevertheless, the voice of a nine men called I Kiao. Oh, a voice called your name, did it? Well, I'll tell you what that voice was. It was opium. That's what that was. Nay, I do not drink the black smoke. I am not an opium fiend. Never smoked opium in your life, eh? Once, nay, replied the man simply. I did not like it. Well, I'll tell you what you do like, then, if you don't like opium, and that is brandy. Tasted that once and didn't like it, eh? And that's why you hear voices, you touch my brandy again, and... No, I do not drink brandy. Well, get the hell out of this, and when I call you, you come. And every time I don't call you, don't come as quickly as you can, see? He added in an effort to bring the whole ridiculous business to its proper ridiculous level. The man silently disappeared. John Lesthwaite threw away the cold butt of his cigar, took another from the box and lighted it. Why was his hand shaking? These confounded, fuddle-headed fools, half awake and half asleep. And with a swine ganging up on him to get a bit of their own back. No, uh, it was he who was being half-witted now, as if Siamese servants would think up a trick like that. It wasn't as though they were Chinese. But no, even they would never have the wit and cunning to plan such a way of frightening him as that. Frightening him? What on earth was he talking about? Why should he be frightened? John Lesthwaite poured himself a half tumbler of whiskey and diluted it with soda water and restraint. Oh, that was better. Well, what do you want? He growled as the grim face of the bullet-headed watchman appeared 
as the man came up the steps leading from the lattice work enclosed veranda down to the garden. The Naimem is calling, the stolid ex soldier replied. Keeps on calling, and nobody answers. These lazy house servants. In spite of the fact that he had just emptied his tumbler, John Lestwaite's mouth seemed a little dry, his tongue inclined to be a trifle stiff, his throat constricted. What? he said, and this time the question was almost whispered. I said the nine men is calling, replied the Gurkha. But Manjit Gurung, don't talk such damned nonsense. And now the master's voice was almost gentle, almost pleading. You know perfectly well that the Naimem is... Yes, yes, I know, of course I know, interrupted the Gurkha. I didn't say your Naimem, though it sounded like her voice. I mean, the Naimem who is in the bungalow now. But there isn't one, Manjit Gurung. I'm quite alone here. There is no Naimem in the bungalow. Well, that's funny. One called. That is why I came up. I went and spoke to I soon, but he said, Yes, yes, all right, I can hear as well as you can, but the Nye was angry about it. Then I met Ai Kiao coming away from the house, and I said, Can't you hear the Nye men calling, you fool? And he said, Yes, I heard her twice, and that when he went to answer, the Nye had abused him. John Lesthwaite sat upright in his long, low chair and glanced from the hard Mongolian face of Manjit Gurung to the empty tumbler. No, he mustn't try to replenish that until he felt better and got his nerves under control. His hand would shake so badly that... Well, good heavens above! What on earth was the matter with him? What infernal, incredible, childish idiocy was this? Was John Hector Montague Lesthwaite actually... What did the Naimem call? He whispered. Well, I don't know. Usual thing? Just boy? No, she called Aikyao by name the last time. Yes, I remember. That was why I went to look for him. But Manjit Gurung, you knew that the Naimem... His voice was almost pleading again. Well, other Naimems come here, don't they, Nai? Lots of times. I thought there was one here now, and... The man stopped and stared curiously at his master. His slant eyes narrowed. No, he said slowly. That isn't right, really. It was your Naimem's voice. As a matter of fact, I forgot for the moment that she is. Well... Don't forget any more, and don't imagine things. You were asleep at... What? Walking? muttered the old soldier as he turned away. There are ghosts about this place, he growled, in his native Gurmukhi of Nepal. As the clip-clop of the man's sandals died away into the night, John Lesthwaite turned to the bottle. Now, of course his hands went shaking. Not so much as to prevent his pouring himself another drink, anyway. Oh, that was better. Now then, to get this straight, or rather to get to the bottom of this nonsense. While it was a case of Siamese servants telling the same story, it could very well be a story. In other words, a damned lie. But a Gurkha wouldn't join in with them. No Gurkha would, especially Manjit Gurung. He despised Siamese too much, especially house servants. And anyway, he was too stupid and probably too simple to take a hand in a game of that sort. Besides, why should he? He and ex-rifleman Manjit Gurung were on excellent terms, quite friends, so far as a watchman and his master could be called that. No, it was utterly absurd. The Gurkha was a straightforward, simple, honest sort of chap, one of the smiling, cheerful, merry and bright sort, in spite of his somewhat grim and cruel-looking face. Given cause, he might be a bit over-handy with his cookery, no doubt. Violence, perhaps, but not trickery of this sort. Not entering into rascally plots and plans with a gang of lying servants. He was a bemedalled and decorated soldier, not a plate-licker. 
No, his entrance into the business made things bad, took away all chance of writing it off as a pack of lies faked up by a gang of swindling swine who... No, that wouldn't do for an explanation now that Magic Gurum was in it. The man had heard a woman calling, or honestly thought he had. Therefore, there was no sense in refusing to believe that the houseboys had. There must be some other explanation. A bird? Some of these oriental birds certainly had funny cries. Some rare specimen might have flown near the house and uttered a cry that sounded like boy and one that sounded like I kiao. No, that wouldn't do. The number two boy said the voice had called him by name and Manjit Gurung said he had heard the voice calling the same name. Could some woman have come into the garden and called? No, most certainly. No Siamese or Chinese woman would call boy. Nor would any native woman shout a man's name round the house like that. Besides, if Aikiao's wife were calling to him, Manjit Gurung would know her voice. It was quite impossible that he would mistake it for that of a Naimem. But the whole thing was preposterous. Talk about much ado about nothing. Rising briskly to his feet, John Lesthwaite shook himself, or shuddered, strode down the veranda and out into the brilliantly moonlit garden. Full moon. Yes, it had been full moon the night she died. Had anybody else heard the voice beside those three? He'd make inquiries tomorrow, ask whether anybody else in the compound had heard the voice. If Manjit Gurung and the two houseboys had heard it, presumably others had. There were always people about around the servants' quarters. As he passed the door of the kitchen, a small detached building connected with the main building by a covered way, the cook appeared at the door. Nay. Well, merciful heaven, if the fellow said that, he too. The Nai Mem is calling. It was the master who recoiled from the servant this time and who glanced around as though for something upon which to sit down. He tried to moisten his lips. He must say something. Something. Ching Lai. You know that the Nai Men is dead, he expostulated, and in his voice there was a clear note of appeal. Yes, agreed the cook simply. Well then, a Nai Mem called, he added as his master stared at him, his face pale in the moonlight, his eyes staring widely, his clean-shaven mouth twitching. Whom did she call? The number one boy. Do you mean she called him by name? First she called boy, and then again boy, and the third time she called I soon. But it couldn't have been the nigh mem, expostulated Lesthwaite. No, it must have been someone else. Yes, agreed Ching Lai with his Chinese smile, calling with her voice. John Lesthwaite made his way back to the house. He had a little difficulty with the steps that led up from the garden to the veranda. They seemed unusually steep and high, and he was very glad to reach his chair. Two Siamese, a Gurkha and a Chinese, all saying the same thing. And that thing, the truth. It was useless and foolish to deny it. Those four had not put their heads together and concocted a tale. Those four, separately and independently, had all heard the voice. Why had he not heard it? That was the impossible thing, the terrible thing, for impossible it was. Supposing he himself now called sufficiently loudly for Ching Lai in the kitchen, Manjit Gurung in the garden, Ai Soon in the drawing room, and Ai Kiao in the back veranda to hear him, how could he himself or anybody else seated here in the veranda fail to do so? John Hector Montague Lesthwaite felt cold in spite of the humid warmth of the night. Why could they hear her and he could not? Was it because that in life he had so shut her out from his own mind and so cut her off from all personal, mental and spiritual contact that now it was impossible for him to... Nonsense! He would be saying next that because he never listened to her when she was alive, he could not hear her when she was dead, as if anyone could hear the dead. But the servants, they had heard her. 
Perhaps he himself would hear her next time. He must listen. He must listen hard, carefully. He must always be listening. He must try to hear her. He must not sleep. He must listen day and night. But why should he? Did he wish to hear the voice of his dead wife, the voice of the woman whom he had... No. No, he had not. He had not done that. It was her heart. She had died. A tired heart. Dr. Jackson had said so himself. What was that? What was that? I care? Had he come again to tell him that again she was... Oh, no. Good Lord. It was daylight. It was morning. Sinburi opinion began to change about John Lesthwaite. He wasn't taking his sad loss so well after all. For a month he had seemed to bear the blow as a man should, with courage and self-control, with dignity and reticence. Uh, but it had not lasted. And behind that facade of defiance of fate, recklessness, occasionally a forced gaiety, the real edifice had been crumbling. He was taking to drink. His best friend, if he had had one, could never have called him abstemious, nor his worst enemy a drunkard. But the friend would have to admit that he was a drunkard now, drunk in the club bar every night, and always the last to leave, seemed positively afraid to go home. One could understand that, perhaps in the circumstances, but on the other hand, could one? He had never seemed as fond of his wife as all that. If no one had ever called him a drunkard, still less would anybody have called him a family man, uxorious. Well, well, one never knew. Fancy Lesthwaite going to pieces like this, with grief. John Lesthwaite sat alone on his veranda, neither drunk nor sober. Not sober by reason of any restraint, with the whisky since sunset, and not drunk, because nowadays it was impossible to get drunk. Drinking since sunset, sunset to moonrise, and tonight the moon would be at the full. If one of those servants came and told him that the nine men was calling, he'd shoot him. He would. He'd shoot him dead. He'd go and get his revolver, his fine, fat, heavy old army revolver, and lay it on the table beside the bottle. But not one of them would dare. Yes, beside the bottle. The bottle and the revolver. They ought to fortify a man. If one of those servants came and said, No, they wouldn't dare. Not one of the houseboys or the cook would dare. But that damned Gurkha would, and enjoy doing it. Well, if he did, he'd shoot him too. If he could hold the revolver steady enough. Yes, he'd sit here all night as he had done that night a month ago. Sit all night, and if one of them came and... But suppose he heard it himself. Oh, God forbid. But wouldn't that be better than not hearing it when everybody else did? Better than having that awful feeling that she had cut him off, cut herself off from him. Better than the feeling that even those wretched servants, Siamese, Chinese, Gurkha, were worthier than... rubbish. An hour dragged by. No sign of Aisun or the number two boy. Nothing from Manjit Gurung. Should he stroll out and see if the cook had got anything to say about the voice of the nine men calling? No. Put ideas into his head. Another hour and no interruption of his peace. Not even by the Gurkha. Peace as if he would ever know such a thing as peace again, or... What was this? What was this? It was a plot. They were in league. With a start that knocked the glass from its place beside his hand, he sat upright in his chair. I soon, I Kiao, Ching Lai, Manjit Gurung, the Gurkha, coming up the steps. And what was that little crowd on the lawn at the bottom? The whole gang of the rest of them, the second watchman, the gardener, pony boy, chauffeur, even the washerman, the dog boy, and what was this? What did they want? What had they heard? Nigh. John Lesthwaite stared 
dry-mouthed at Isoon, his number one boy. Nay, said Isoon, the spokesman of the group that stood in respectful silence with crossed hands and bowed heads, all save the Gurkha, who stood at attention. Nay, the Nai Mem is calling. We have all come because we have all heard the Nai Mem calling. John Lestwaite tried to speak, tried to advance upon the silent band who stood there before him as though with the courage of fear, fear of something beside which his wrath was as nothing. But no muscle of his body moved, save those of his lips, from which no sound came. A tense and terrible silence. Suddenly John Lesswit dropped rather than sat down in his chair. His head fell back and his eyes closed. Was this a stroke? A heart attack? His liquor getting back at him at last? Was he dying? Would he see her and would she? When he again opened his eyes, he was alone. Well, what a thing to do. Fancy John Hector Montague Lesthwaite fainting. <laughs> Liver, that was it. Couldn't be the whiskey. Who had ever seen him the worse for liquor? And he emptied into his glass the remainder of the contents of the bottle that he had opened that evening and drank it neat. Oh, that was better. What was it he had been going to do? Yes, those damned servants. He'd teach them who was master here, ganging up on him like that. The swine, the ungrateful swine. He'd teach them to disobey his definite and emphatic order not to come telling him a pack of lies. Boy! He roared at the top of his powerful voice. Yes, he'd showed them. Boy! He bawled again. Oh, they could hear imaginary voices and couldn't hear that, couldn't they? Wouldn't come, wouldn't they? By gad, they'd be sorry if he went to them instead. I soon, he roared. I kiao. Rising to his feet, he seized the empty bottle by the neck. He'd brain that... No. No, this wouldn't do. He must pull himself together. Beneath his dignity to go searching for his own houseboys... He'd send Manjit Gurung to fetch them. Watchman, he bawled, and again. Ho, Manjit, come here. What? The Gurkha too? By God, that put the lid on it. He had had enough. Now he'd show them something. Striding through the drawing room to the back veranda, where one of them must be, he was amazed to find the place empty. Bawling, boy! Out into the darkness, at the top of his voice, he turned and rushed up the back stairs. Nobody in the bedrooms. From open windows and verandas, he shouted with the full strength of his lungs. The night resounded with his roars. Boy! 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 Down the front stairs, through the dining room, out again to the back veranda. The house was deserted. Snatching up a riding whip, he ran out into the garden. With his own hand, he'd thrash the first one he met. Siamese, Chinese or Gurkha, cringing houseboy or fighting soldier. He'd show them who was master. Round the house like a madman he rushed. And then across the back compound to the stables. Scarcely could he believe the evidence of his senses. Not a groom or stable boy, no gardener, no chauffeur, no washerman, not even a dog boy, not even a servant's servant or hanger-on, not a soul about the place. Ah, uh, well, the cook. He'd have to bear the brunt of it then. The cook should have come when he heard the knife bawling. To the cookhouse he ran, kicked open the door and found the place. Empty. And then the truth dawned upon him. They had gone. They had deserted him. Vanished as though the place were a plague-stricken charnel house. As though he, their master, were a leper. They had gone. 
the rats had left the sinking ship. As frightened now, as he was angry, he made one more despairing effort. Striding swiftly across to the front of the house, he filled his lungs with air, and as though bawling at a marching battalion, roared at the top of his voice for his staunch Gurkha watchman. Manjit! Manjit! The old soldier wouldn't go. He wouldn't desert his master. He wouldn't stand in with a gang of scullions. He was a man. Again, he shouted, and again. And only the distant echo replied. Silence. Utter silence. Even the pie dogs, usually so clamorous at full moon, were silent. If only he could hear the sound of drumming from one of the temples. This silence, this dreadful silence. And at any moment, she might call. He might see her. One more despairing cry he raised with all his strength. And then, turning on his heel, John Lesthwaite walked slowly up the steps into the veranda and picked up the heavy revolver. <laughs>